Good afternoon, everybody. I have the wonderful job of keeping you awake for the next 25 minutes after you ate. I always seem to be in this situation. All right, I'm going to try to challenge all of you over the next 25 minutes. I want all of you to start thinking about who you are as software developers. Really, I want you to start thinking about what your philosophies are, what you guys believe in, what do you think is important to you, and maybe I can twist your brains a little bit and change your minds in the next 25 minutes. So let's start right here. I got to prepare your minds for a little, little bit here. And what I'm really also hoping to do is share with you, I think, things that are going to make you better go developers at the end of the day. Now look, right in the beginning right here, I find this really fascinating. We became, as an industry, really, really impressed with programs that had large amounts of code. Look, the Linux operating system has 25 million lines of code in it. You guys want to work on that project? I don't want to work on that project. Nobody else can work on that. That is really an, almost an impossible task. I'm going to explain to you how and why lines of code actually are really important. This is another one I have to deal with all the time in training. We've been trained to deal with these really large abstractions, like this is some sort of feature. Let's abstract, extract the abstractions on top of the abstractions. And then we try to figure out why we can't figure out what's going on. No, I think one of the most beautiful things about Go and its interface and the way the, the compiler works is that we can have very thin layers of decoupling and still gain all the benefits of what we're trying to accomplish in terms of encapsulation. These are things that I'm trying to help teach. Now, we're not going to talk about hardware and performance today, but that fourth point, I think, is the one that's missed the most. This is the one that hurts me the most. We all forget as engineers that every decision you make comes with a cost. And I think some of this is lost because the languages we've been using sit on top of a virtual machine. Remember, Go's model is the real machine. And what's fascinating about having the real machine is you get the opportunity to understand the code you're writing and how it's going to perform. And when you have that power, then you have the real power engineering-wise to know and understand the costs that you are taking. For me, engineering is not about writing a piece of code that works because thanks to Google, a six-year-old can write a program today that works. Engineering is about knowing what costs you are taking for the decisions you are making. And if you don't understand the costs, you are hacking. And that's not going to end well. Now, what I want from you, at least for the next 20 minutes, is to aspire to these things. I want you to start becoming a champion for quality, efficiency. And I want you to have a point of view. Don't be afraid. This is not about right or wrong. It's about, again, what is your belief and what is that cost you're taking and why is that cost worth what you're gaining out of it? Think about these things. Self-review all the time. Because look, technology changes quickly. It absolutely does, and our minds do change slowly. And look, it's easy to adopt new technology, but it's hard to adopt new ways of thinking. This is a big challenge, and one of Go's strengths is we have to start adopting some new ways of thinking if you want to be successful. We have to do that. I'm going to share some of those things with you. But if you meet me in a bar, and I've been drinking whiskey, and you tell me you're a software developer, this is one of the first questions I'm going to ask you. What is the legacy you're leaving behind? What is the legacy? Look, I didn't say it here. Peter said it. There's two kinds of software projects. Those that fail and those that turn into legacy horrors. <laughs> right? Look, at the end of the day, what are we being paid for? To get code in production because that's where we solve the problems. That code doesn't get in production. That project's failed. If the project gets into production and you're like, we ain't touching that code. We don't know what we're going to break. Now we got legacy problems. And look, every time I walk into a bank and they tell me they're rewriting the banking software, you know what I do? I run home and start printing out statements because I don't want to wake up in the morning and see no money and have no proof that I had at least a dollar in the bank. Yeah, there is a ton of legacy software out there. And look, legacy software is an unappreciated but serious problem, and it's going to be the downfall of civilization. I want Hollywood to stop making movies about asteroids and earthquakes. I want a movie where the lights turn off because every piece of legacy code on the planet has just shut down. 
And since there aren't any unit tests, we have no clue what more damage we're all about to add. And guess what? It's all your fault. <laughs> all of you. Look, this is one of my most favorite quotes in all of my training. And it's said by Sarah May. I love this one. We think awful code is written by awful devs, but in reality, it's written by reasonable devs in awful circumstances. Look, I'm going to be honest with you. I've been in situations where I've looked at a piece of code and I said, what drugs was this person on when they did this? And why are they not sharing those? Because they must have been good. We've got to have a little compassion. The reality is that probably that developer was stuck in a really bad situation, and that was the only way out. But if we're writing code without that understanding of what is the legacy we're leaving behind, we're going to put more and more people in those situations every single day. And for me, if you want to write code that is going to at least bare minimum minimize these legacy issues, you've got to learn to start refactoring as part of your development process every day. It is not something you do a week from now, a month from now, and I don't ever want to hear we don't have time for that, Bill because you don't have time not to do it. When I write a piece of code, as soon as I get some of it working, I'm refactoring. I'm doing code readability reviews. I'm validating that I have a strong mental model of that code right now. Mental models for me are everything in the code we're writing if you do not want to be writing legacy code out of the box. And I've got clients today who are writing legacy code out of the box. I will say to them, you know this code's not maintainable, right? Yes, Bill. What are we doing about it? Oh, well, we're going to fix that. No, you're not going to fix that. You've already set the next deadline. Yeah, Bill. OK. Here's the invoice. We'll keep doing this. Look, I love Tom Love. Tom Love works on very large, he's the inventor of Objective-C, works on very large projects for the Department of Defense in the US. And he said this one day, he says, imagine that you have a project that ends up with a million lines of code. You know the probability of that project being successful in the United States is less than 50%. You know why he's saying that? Because he did a study, and he identified that a box of copy paper has 100,000 lines of code in it. That means one ream of copy paper. I want you to put that in your head right now. One ream of copy paper is about 10,000 lines of code. And what he's saying is the average developer, everybody in this room, really cannot maintain a mental model of more than 10,000 lines of code. Once that happens, we start having problems. And that doesn't mean memorizing every line of code. It knows. It means that you know where everything is. If I ask you, where is that function? Where is that logic? What's going on here? You can find it reasonably reasonably quickly, and when you can't, you're starting to lose your mental models. That's what I'm talking about, about code readability reviews for me. I begin to start making sure that I know where everything is, and as soon as I go to look for something and I don't find it, I go back to, why did I look here when it wasn't there? What's going on? And as you add more code, you're going to have to do these things. Look, it's all about the cognitive load we have on us, and as to software developers, we have a lot. All of my friends in San Francisco drive me crazy because they want to add, on top of the fact that we have to understand our business, that we have to understand how to write code, we have to understand all of those things, they want to throw like DevOps on top of us, on top of everything else. I'm like, dude, my brain, I don't know, maybe I'm 48 years old, but I can't handle anymore. This is enough. Look, cognitive load is serious, and it does apply to what's happening with our mental models. And we already saw this Brian Kernahan quote already today, right? The hardest bugs are those where your mental model situation is just wrong, and you can't see it. Look, you might find this interesting, but for the 25 years I've been writing software and I've been managing teams, you're not allowed to turn a debugger on without getting my permission. And if I catch you on a debugger and you didn't ask for my permission, I send you home. You want to go home for the day? Just say, Bill, come here, look, there's a debugger on. I'm all packed. Good, go home. Because at the end of the day, if there's a problem in production, you're not turning your debugger on. You're not. So if you have no mental model of your code base, if you don't have logs that have more signal than noise, if you don't know how to use the tooling there during development, you're, you're done. You're done in production. We can't afford that. We just can't. So mental models are so important, and you only know if you have them during that development and during that testing cycle. And I want you to start thinking about the code you're working on right now. 
Do you really feel like you have a strong mental model of the code that you're working? Do you really know where everything is? Do you know? Are you working on code bases already? There are more than 10,000 lines of code. That's why these projects fail. You need 100 people on a project with a million lines of code. Probably most of us work on teams of three or four people. How hard is it just to get three, or, three to four people to just agree to the same thing, to row the boat in the same direction? We want to do that with 100 people, and then we wonder why it fails. Lines of code for me actually is really important. It really identifies, in some levels, the health of a project and the health of a team. And one of the things I think is amazing about Go is that it gives us the ability to write less code and get more work done, which is why abstractions on top of abstractions also drive me crazy. I got hired to, 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 um, to convert 100,000 line of codes of C program, and we did it in seven weeks with under 10,000 lines of code. Took 100,000 lines of code of C, converted it down to less than 10,000. That's not me, that's Go. That's applying these ideas and philosophies that less is always going to be more. Okay, so mental models are very, very important. Do you really have an understanding and a mental model of the code you're working on today? If not, why? How are you going to get there? Look, correctness versus performance. We became an industry where if somebody can get on this stage and show you how they can shave 10 milliseconds, 10 nanoseconds off of a program, we put them on a pedestal. Oh, wow, that, that, that person really knows what they're doing because they're able to make code run really fast. No, I want to stop putting those people on a pedestal. I want to put people on a pedestal who know how to write code that's so simple that everybody in this room can read it and understand it regardless of where you are right now in your career. That's the kind of code we need. That's the code that's going to reduce our legacy problems. Look, we've known this for a long time. Wes Dyer, make it correct, make it clear, make it concise, make it, then make it fast in that order. These quotes coming from people throughout decades of, of, of programming experience keep telling us. I love this one from Al. Correctness is the most important concern. There's no royal road. Look, he, he marks three things in this quote that are important. Invariance, which from my perspective means you've got to understand the decisions you're making and the costs you're taking and the impact they have on the machine or on your program. Testing and code reviews. And those two things require your ability to learn how to read code. I say this all the time. We are an industry where we ask people to learn how to write before we teach them how to read. Think about that. Ask people to learn how to write before we teach them how to read. And then we wonder why our code is the way it is. Being able to read code is so important in order to be able to get to this level of correctness. And for me, correctness is about our ability to make good engineering decisions, not about right or wrong, our ability to write code that we can all read. Look, basic ideas are good style, fundamental to writing clear and simple, as they were 35 years ago. This isn't new ideas. And I think the Go programming language is bringing all this stuff back in front of us. And it's really an opportunity for everybody in this room to start changing the way they think about code changing the way they think about what they're doing and starting to take this opportunity. For me, Go is an opportunity for you to finally write less code and do more. Okay, but the Jason Fried quote may be one of my favorite too. Look, Jason Fried, problems can usually be solved with simple mundane solutions. There's no glamorous work. You don't get to show off. You build something, you get it done. There's no oohs and ahs. When people ask me what I do, I tell them, I build air conditioners. They go, what? I, know, I build air conditioners. Hasn't everybody in this room been comfortable? Well, I heard you were a little cold. But you're comfortable now. You haven't thought about the AC system once while I've been up here talking. But if it starts to break down, I might as well not even be on this stage. That's the only thing you're going to think about. Look, if you're writing code in Go, you're building back-end systems. If you're building back-end systems, they cannot shut down. If somebody knows your name, your system has failed. You need to be in the background. Your goal every day is nobody knows who I am. Hey, you want the oohs and ahs? You be a front-end dev. 
But I promise you this. You're going to spend two weeks working on a screen, and you're going to show it to somebody, and they're going to complain about something right out of the box. Yeah, not, not fun. I could, not, I could not do it. I need you to get into that mindset, okay? So I want to just talk about three things here real quick while i got ten more minutes with you. For me, you must have a priority when you're writing code, if you're going to write code, with the idea of correctness over performance. The first thing is integrity. And from my perspective, this language focuses and wants our software to have the highest level of integrity that it can. Integrity is a priority. Integrity means that everything we're doing our reads, our writes at a micro level, our data transformations at a macro level, are accurate, consistent, and efficient. We must get serious about reliability. Look, let me ask you a question. If this phone right here, this phone stops working for the next hour in this country, stops working for the next hour, serious question. How many people die? Serious. How many people lose their lives in the next hour if that phone stops working. I can tell you one thing, it's not zero. You must take this seriously. And don't wanna hear that, Bill, the systems I'm building don't put people's lives at risk. No, every single system puts somebody's lives at risk. I don't care what it is, because at the end of the day, maybe somebody's having a very bad day, and your system was the final straw. <laughs> huh? You know, in the 90s, I wrote a system that was supposed to send faxes out to pharmacies for a hospice, and it broke down over the weekend and somebody died. That was the message I got on a Monday. Somebody died, Bill, because your software didn't work. You got to take this seriously. And if you don't, I can tell you this, you're not working for me. Integrity's got to be your number one priority. It has to be, all right? And there are things around this, writing less code. Look, there was a study done, and it identified that the average developer will produce 15 to 50 bugs per thousand lines of code. I want you to put yourself in the worst developer category. That means for every 20 lines of code you write, you've introduced a bug into your system. It's simple math, lines of code are important. You want to have less bugs? Write less code. You want to be able to have a project that doesn't turn into a legacy horror situation? We need to write less code and have teams appropriate to that size. And error handling is so important too. I love the way Go does error handling. I don't buy into this idea that people are trying to make it, no. Error handling is so important to integrity. Look at these stats. This was a study done. 48 critical failures in these products, and Redis is on the list. How many lives are dependent on Redis today? And 48, 92% of those bugs that caused those systems to crash could have been avoided with better error handling. We got to take this seriously. We have to. We have to. So integrity is number one, and you cannot bypass it, and it can't be trumped. And if you're doing a code review and you see an integrity issue, you've got to fix it. There's no nothing. Okay, number two is readability. Readability to me means two things. It means that everybody on your team can comprehend the code you're writing. It also means that every line of code, you understand the cost and impact that it's going to have. One of Go's brilliant abilities is giving us the ability to look at a line of code and understand the impact it's going to have on the machine, and then the tooling to validate that. But let's quickly talk about the first thing. The average developer on your team. So I want you to think about yourself for a second. In fact, I want you all to think about the teams that you work on right now. Think about every single individual. Put them in your head. I want to ask yourself a question. Reflect. Am I the average developer on my team? Am I less than average, or am I more than average? Now I want you to do the same exact thing for every person you work with on that code base. I want you to evaluate who's average, who's less than average, and who's more than average. And if you're hiring somebody today for your team, and you don't know this, 
Think about the disruption you're just about to add. If you hire somebody who's less than average on this team, you realize that you need now spend time to bring them up to speed so they can understand this code base. For me, sometimes it's worse to bring on somebody who's more than average because we've got to teach them to what? Be less clever. Whew, that's even harder sometimes. So who are you bringing on your team? Look, you put me on a crypto team. I'm so far behind. It's going to take me a long time. i got to come up. You put me on a team that's building web APIs, I've got to make sure I'm not being so clever. This is so important. If we don't want to be writing legacy code out of the box, if we want to optimize for correctness, then we have to face realities of who we are, who our teams are, and the code we're writing. Can that average developer understand every line of code? The other part is the cost of the impact. You must be able to understand the impact of your code. I want to show you something that best describes what I mean about being able to understand the impact of any line of code, being able to understand what's happening. Our object-oriented programming languages call these things features. Look, here's a struct. It's got a constructor, a destructor, a copy constructor, a move constructor, operator, overload, equals. We don't have these things in Go, do we? But these are considered features. OK, you've seen this type, right? You've seen in all its glory. And I'm going to also add a function called f1. This is C++, but you all can read it. Here's a function named f1. It returns a value of type foo. And it creates that value or that object of type foo. And it returns a copy of it. There it is. It returns a copy. You see it. Now, you've seen all 18 lines of code. Here's the part about readability. These are things that you don't want happening in your code. Look on line 23. Look on line 27. Are you ready? And I've shown you all the code. How many objects get created, does and when the constructors get called, copy constructors get called, move, or the assignment operator? When do all of those things happen on just those two lines of code? And if you can't tell me, then you have hidden a huge amount of cost in your code. And you cannot look at that line of code and reason about the impact it's going to have on anything. And by the way, if you don't ask me what version of C++ we're using, you're already wrong. The reality is that in the latest versions of C++, there's optimizations that take the copies away on the first line. One object will get created, and that's it. But the same exact call in a different context on line 27 will produce the object inside the function, produce the copy, start causing all those other little methods, our features, behind the scenes to execute. And I've seen people put database calls in those things. Oh, yeah. Look, I think one of the strengths of Go is that we don't have these features. And that everything we do gives you a reasonable opportunity to understand the cost of that code and what it's doing. The reasonable. And as you learn more and learn the tooling and do these things, you'll see it. You'll make really great engineering decisions because at the end of the day, you understand the cost that you're taking. This is one of the biggest things I do try to teach week after week. I try to teach people that Go is this amazing language. It allows for the developers who are just starting out to not even understand there's a machine there. Yet the model is the real machine. You don't have to know anything about the machine code and go and have a tremendous amount of success and have code that's really fast. It's brilliant. And then with just a couple of days, I can start showing you how that code is readable to the point where you understand the impact you're having on the machine. And you can start even making better engineering decisions. But Go is constantly pushing us in the right direction anyway. Over the last four years, as I, have I learned this language and I've peeled the onion, it's been an amazing journey for me. I, myself, have just become a better engineer and developer just by learning how the language thinks and how the language gives us all of these opportunities to just do the right thing all the time. So I want you, moving forward, to really think about what is the legacy you're leaving behind? And is that the legacy you want to leave behind? Or do you want to be, leave behind a situation where we're not walking down the street anymore and wondering when the lights are going to come out? I don't want that reality. Thank you.